Hi, we're, we're going to interview my dad, Roger Fry, on October 8th of 2022. So my first question, Dad, is what year were you born? First of December 44, and I remember the day. Okay, I don't remember the time exactly from my memory, but I remember people telling me about being born on that day. Where were you born? Where? Where? <laughs> now, see, that's a whole other thing. Okay, it was Oildale, California, and I think they called it Cottage Hospital. Cottage Hospital. And Which is just north of Bakersfield, California, if that's interesting to anybody. It is. It's still there today. And do you, are you aware of anything else that happened on the day that you were born? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's kind of a... Gene Hall was born the same day. <laughs> Gene Hall? Oh, he was. Yeah, he, he had my yes. same birthday. Yes. In fact, very few people that I've met in life who had my same birthday, but I did meet another Roger Fry that had the same birthday. Really? In school, in high school, yeah. And Dean Hall, to clarify that, is a friend that we met in Arkansas. And he got my dad into preaching school, and we all moved to Colorado. What were your grandparents like? So, wow. So there were lots of grandparents in my time. And uh, my grandfather and grandmother on mom's side, Oxley's. And then her name, of course, was Parker, which is the same way it names, same name as mom's name. So... We wondered if there might be an intermingling of family there, that she's my way off cousin, distant cousin. But as it turns out, we really couldn't find any roots that connected. But uh, Grandma and Grandpa Oxley were wonderful Christian people, and I got to see them a lot. In fact, uh, when Mom and Dad came to California, they came all together with the family. So you, um, I mean, the story is huge. We don't have time for that on a video, probably, if it's going to be, like, short. But... Um, when uh, they, they were hospitable. I, I remember eating good food at Grandma's and Grandpa's house. Um, Grandma was, uh, was not willing to put up with foolishness. She would scold you, which is fine, which we needed sometimes. <laughs> go, go figure. Right. <laughs> Some people need scolding yes, sometimes. Yes. But anyway, she was glad to be um, a loving, friendly. She wasn't a laughing person, and Grandpa wasn't either. They were... Um, they came from the Depression era, and they took life seriously and, and thought that the biblical concept of being sober meant be sober. And I do remember them laughing. It wasn't that they weren't happy yeah. people, but on the on Dad's side, Grandma and Grandpa Fry, Pearl Freeman, I, no, Freeman. Was Freeman her last name? Wow, I've, that, that's going to escape me. But, uh, so, but uh, Grandpa Fry and Grandma Fry were... Um, citizens of the Ozarks in Missouri and so from time to time we went to visit them and it was marvelous visits in the Ozarks the hills of the Ozarks in the back country and we just had a blast when we visited there I can't remember much about the personality of my grandpa Fry except that he was a lot like my brother Norman as far as looks and, and size and strength very strong and grandma she moved from the Ozarks to uh, Greensburg, uh, Greensburg Kansas and so we visited her there last, and uh, the last visit was in 1963. She was more of a jovial, laughing person, but again, from the era of the Depression, and so she took life seriously. And I don't remember any of those people being laughing, jovial people. They were they took life seriously, and and you know, this is how life was. They needed to. But, and I find this unique. Where did the Oxleys live compared to you guys? So when I was a child, Grandma and Grandpa had a place on Plymouth Drive in Oildale, California. And uh, Dad and Mom bought a little old house. And then Dad did extensive renovations to the house. But Grandpa was a carpenter. Grandpa Oxley was a carpenter. And so not only he, but he and the family would come and help dad do the renovation. So they built on like a bathroom. There was no bathroom on the house when they bought it as far as I know. There was nothing that I know of in the house, but they built a, a porch bathroom on the back of the house, a kitchen and a dining area for the family of, at the time, nine. And uh, well, I guess Daryl and Wanda would have been born in that house. I guess I was too, now that I think about it. And uh, so, in reflecting back, the, the but the house was a very small house by today's standards, but we didn't know. So it was a great house to live, to grow up in. We played uh, the roll the ball over the roof called uh, Rover. Annie, yeah. Rover, Rovers, and one over. 
boy, that's, you know, that's crazy. I know the name of that game, but it's something like and a rover or rover, 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 throw the ball over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then so someone would throw the ball over the house and the people on the other side, if they caught it, they could run around and hit somebody and put them <laughs> out. And if, if they didn't catch it, I can't remember what the rule was on that. Then you just throw it back, I guess, and see if the other team caught it and then run around the house and hit somebody with the ball. We had a blast. I mean, it, so there were lots of games that we played in that little bitty house that we didn't count as a little bitty house, but in the the bedroom for the boys, well, when I was a baby, we had Frida and me in a bed, and I suppose Myrna and Daryl in a bed across from us. And then as we got older, it was me and Daryl and Norman and Dennis. And so not sure why they didn't put the bigger with the smaller, but anyway, it was the two big boys and the two little boys together in the bed. How'd that, how'd we get off on that from the mom? What'd you ask? Well, what I was Which getting, hospital I was in? No, no, no. What I was getting to is, is when you guys were next door neighbors. Okay, yeah. So we weren't the neighbors no. then. So I'm saying that the house that dad built, I got off track, didn't I? The, the house that dad reconstructed, renovated, was within walking distance if you were healthy. I would say it was at least a mile, but it might not have been that far. I was a little. And then uh, later on in life, but, but I mean, we were always over there a lot. I, I mean, I, so there were pictures of it, but I remember the men from church sitting on Grandpa's porch and having the business meetings there. Oh, really? And um, it, on that porch, they all decided to give up smoking. Hmm. Uh, so Dad was a cigar smoker until mm -hmm. I remember that meeting, and he, when he came home from that, there was no more smoking. Hmm. That was the last one. Never remember another one. And uh, so in, then Grandma and Grandpa moved from Plymouth, in Oildale to Green Acres on a five acre plot of land, one house on it, and eventually Arnold and Irma Stone bought property next to them on the north side, and Dad and Mom bought property on the south side, each got an acre and a quarter. And um, they both built houses. Arnold built a smaller house than Dad, but Arnold's family was smaller. And uh, Dad's house has, um, he built it with three bedrooms, but one of them was used as a freezer room for years. And so the freezer bedroom, I think was Wanda's and Myrna and Frieda shared a bedroom. And then Daryl and uh, Norman and Dennis and I all shared one bedroom. So it was a, it slept all 10 of us. I don't remember where Charles slept as a, as a small child. I, I that, that escapes me, but uh, he may have been in the freezer room and Wanda might've been in the girls room, but we'd have to ask them. So what were your parents like growing up? Your grandma and grandpa. My grandma and grandpa. Grandma and grandpa Fry. So I would just say now, that like, knowing what I know now about human family, um, they were in the top 1% of parents in, across all of the history. And as far as I'm concerned, they were the best parents in history because they were mine, right? But uh, dad and mom, had to keep chaos out of the house, and so they disciplined as necessary, frequently for Daryl and I. <laughs> it was often, but but they were happy, they were friendly, they were they were heart in their heart. They were disciples of Jesus and acted like it, behaved like it, mm -hmm. and uh, they never did really sit us down and pray with us or anything like that. That wasn't who they were. Um, they they prayed in their closet, like Jesus said, "You go to your closet and pray." So they prayed often, and Mom prayed, I think, constantly. And um, But it wasn't, come over here, we're going to pray. She would just say her prayers and make, say them on the move, so to speak. And uh, she was well prayed. She, she posted uh, memory verses over the house that she thought would be beneficial not only for her, but for her children. And so if you walked into the kitchen, there'd be 10 memory verses posted on the refrigerator and the cabinet and the cupboard. And, mm -hmm. and so she would write them out and uh, later on type them out. And later on, I, I don't know if she ever did a computer printout. That probably didn't happen. But her family probably did it for her. But so mom and dad were, um, they were enthusiastic people. They, they liked to get out and go for hikes and walks in the hills, go to the ocean, uh, go to the beach, uh, walk in the sand. What did grandpa do for a living? So grandpa was a provider for, for the family. And he, he took his work seriously and, and um, didn't have much of an education as far as school education, but I think he finished the seventh or eighth grade, but 
He was doing advanced math when I was a child and was working for Shell Oil Company as a surveyor. But he worked for them his entire career and uh, provided well for the family and built quite a nest egg for mom and dad to, to retire on. And so when he retired, I mean, they could afford to buy a new car and pay cash for it and, and whatever they needed. And they had many funds they could have used in different ways. But um, also having come through the Depression era, they, they realized that it was good to have a nest egg available in case, just in case. And so um, they, um, they never lived a life of uh, wealth. They lived a life of um, financial control. They spent money, they loaned money to their children when they needed it. They gave money to people who needed it. They, they were generous, more so than what. So I, I and again, they, they believe that you, you don't tell the world what you're doing, you do it for God, and God seeing secretly rewards openly. That's what they believe, that's what they live. And um, I, just, I just knew in the back of my head when I left, when Mom and I left for Oregon, I knew in the back of my head if I needed help, mm -hmm. my $100 wasn't far enough. If I asked mom and dad, there was going to be some help. So I, I guess I was never concerned. I, I think that we believed, as young children and as and as uh, young adults, that if we needed help, we had it. There was no doubt about it. My head, so, but marvelous people, Grandma yes. and Grandpa Fry. Yes, I agree. In my opinion, in the top echelons of the human race, yes. they fit right in. Did they sin? Absolutely. Were they forgiven? Absolutely. And they they felt it every day. Yeah. <laughs> What year did you graduate from high school, and what school was it? And bonus, what's the mascot? <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, I I had a school that was um, what maybe 10, 15 minutes from the house. We rode the school bus to it. So my high school for all four years was Bakersfield High School, with the mascot the drillers being a driller who was an oil well driller. Um, because Bakersfield was a drilling city for oil, so, and oil wells all over the, the outskirts of the city. And in, uh, in the back of Grandma's yard, it was actually an oil well in the back of her yard, she had agreed to sell the mineral rights to a company and they drilled an oil well. But the, the uh, Bakersfield High School, I, I haven't had any dreams late that I remember, but I have had dreams about that school through, through life. And generally the halls are, infinite, and the stairwells are infinite, and you never know when you're going to get to the end of one. <laughs> the classrooms might be might have a, a teacher, or it's in my dreams, but I mean, so it was a, a well, very well organized school, and my major in school was the uh, agronomy, so I wanted to be a farmer, I really wanted to be a rancher, and my junior high instructor said to the class, unless you marry well, you will not have a cattle farm, cattle ranch. Mm. And so he was a dream deflator, and I kind of believed him. I don't know why, but at the time I had not met any of the people who said dream big and then move toward the dream. So I did not do that in high school, but my dreams still met well with what I had hoped would happen. I didn't realize my dreams were all going to be tied up in Linda Parker. <laughs> but Baker's School High School, good school. Um, and then after, so there were two main high schools in in the Bakersfield North End, Bakersfield, <laughs> Bakersfield Oildale area. One was North High School, which my brother, oldest brother Norman went to for, oh. I think all of his years, maybe pleaded too. I don't think either of them ever went to Bakersfield High. I think Myrtle went to Bakersfield High her senior year, and I went for all three. That makes no sense. She must have been there. But June, but in Bakersfield High School, they divided the, the uh, what's the new school course called? That uh, uh, freshmen. Freshmen. Freshmen were not allowed to mingle with the senior uh, school members because I suppose even then there was bullying. What year did you graduate? 1963. 1963. So, hi, we're here continuing our interview with Roger Fry. Gail asked some questions, and now myself, Jeff, Gail's husband, I'm going to ask a few questions. Well, my first question for you would be, do you have a holiday tradition, and what is your favorite thing about the holidays? 
So, see, now there is the question, and the scriptures clearly teach that some people hold one day above another, and some people won't. And typically, I don't, because throughout work life, the specific holidays, I had to work on them. And so, Mom and I always said, we'll celebrate when we get to it. And so, that's what we've always done, and that's the high point. I mean, it's, it's an education, I, I say, from, from God, that says, you're free to celebrate, when you want and we always did that and um, so yeah so my favorite holiday let's just think if there's a favorite one of mine because generally speaking I just celebrate every day I I'm there so there's no really special days but I love being with the family and I love being you know mom and I of course just traveled and went places and but we celebrated Every Sunday, we would go like to pizza in, in Oregon. We'd mm -hmm. go to pizza with the church group, with our friends, and we'd sit and laugh and have fun. And What do you do more than that in life? You just celebrate, for me, every day. <laughs> and of course, that, biblically speaking, that's a great answer, but I, I would also look at this question saying, thinking back, you know, for Gail and I, it would have to be, of course, the Thanksgivings and the Christmas, because oh, yeah. just simply from the mere fact we were able to visit. Able to visit, yeah. You know, but that doesn't preclude the fact that we visited in April, and that was a great tradition, too, or a great uh, opportunity. But, yeah, that's a... So, yeah, great... well, I mean, based on that, any time family gets together, that's yeah. special. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. the events where that happened, whether it was a special holiday or not, yeah, I always rejoice when family comes, so... All right, well, on the heels of that question, let's ask another one. Uh, were you named after a family member, or does your name have any special meaning? Is, or is it just a name that your parents like? Was there any significance? So, honestly, I've always said, and I don't know that I ever heard anybody say it, but when a pilot is given instruction, they always say, Roger that. <laughs> I like that because it means I understand. But mom and dad, if they named me after someone, it was Oliver Wendell Holmes, the just, great justice of the Supreme Court. Um, great, great uh, mental, I mean, he was a, a, probably a genius. So they did like him and his, I believe his stand on the Supreme Court. So my middle name comes from him. My first name, if there was someone, I don't know who it was. And I don't remember ever asking mom specifically about that, except the Oliver Wendell Holmes thing. So. First name, no. Second name, yes. Well, I think that answer there is probably something that a lot of us have not heard before about the middle name. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting to hear that. And, uh, Just for the record, Ted Theodore is named after Theodore Roosevelt because Mom and I both appreciated him as a man, as a man who excelled and exceeded all the expectations of him. And so, Ted. Was Gail named after a whale? Well, you know, Gail does rhyme with well, and she probably, she probably had that in her life sometimes as people who thought they were going to be bullies. And, but Gail is actually, Mom and I loved Mom's name. Mom's middle name was Gail. Yeah. And I can't remember what she was. There, there was definitely a, a naming sequence of events there. So we named Gail after Mom's middle name, and um, we didn't want them both to have Linda. So that's... Her name comes from her mother. And now we've handed Gail's name down to our daughter. That is her middle name. I think that's marvelous. Rebecca Gail. All right, so as we continue the interview, how about another question where we really kind of already talked about this. You talk about your high school and you talk about agronomy. But other than agronomy, you, you kind of said that was maybe a profession you wanted to go into. But outside of that, did you have a favorite subject in school or was that your favorite subject? It was my subject. It was my favorite subject because, uh, believe it or not, we got to ride horses, we got to go to the farm, we got to, so, I mean, it was a, an in-depth study. We got to, well, do everything about farm animals that you would do. Um, there was one cow that had a uh, window glass in her stomach so you could open it up and look into the stomach and see what she was digesting that day. Um, so it was a, not only, it was a scientific course that included how to manage businesses of any sort really how to keep the records how to um, how to do it all and so I will just say that had not Mr. Gene Martin been in my life I might have gone into farming but he was and he was an amazingly good input but he put all of the, all the boys on the farm to work 
And uh, I realized that um, agriculture might not be my favorite subject, but I was doing the manual labor for a dollar an hour. And the manual labor included shovels, picking up rocks, uh, some, a lot of stuff that I did enjoy, but it was good hard work. Shovel work will build your muscles, I guarantee you, and especially if you're trying to keep up with a man structured like Mr. Gene Martin. And Daryl and I were not willing to do less shovels than he did, so we worked hard. <laughs> but I learned that farm work was not necessarily my favorite thing to do. If it had been a cattle farm, it would have been different. But anyway, I decided that as Gene would tell stories, he would talk about the wood products industry. And so I built a dream in my head about working for the wood products industry and getting rich that way. And that was the direction we went. So for agronomy, did you have one teacher, multiple teachers? So there were multiple teachers. Um, and I only really remember two of them for whatever reason, but for the four years and maybe even every semester. But Mr. Brockmeyer was my teacher of memory. And the other teacher is on the tip of my tongue, but I can't bring it out right this minute. He's the one that kind of tried to trash our dreams about having a cattle farm. But, um, yeah, Mr. Brockmeyer, he was the teacher that stands out in my head. He was very quiet-spoken. Uh, he, It was mostly a classroom of boys, but he kept, he kept the handle on it. There was no issues in that classroom that I can recall. And... Um, Yeah, good teachers. All right. Well, this question probably uh, it relates back to stuff we've already talked about. But when you think of your parents, and I would assume your answer to this is love for people. But what is the most important lesson that your parents taught you? Mm, wow. So, in my in my mental in my mind's eye. I'm so, it wasn't like a lesson, but I will say that, and I, and I tell this story, and, and some of you, I don't know that I did it when my children were babies or not, but I remember on Sharon Wayne, so I don't remember the age, but we were young. Mom and Dad would, Dad would come home from work, and maybe weekends, Sundays, they would take a blanket out, throw it across the grass. We had uh, push mowers in those days, but the grass would always be where there was grass because there was so many of us we trampled grass pretty bad so there was mostly trails <laughs> and bare, bare ground but I remember there being grass out by the waterfall in the backyard and we would throw that blanket on the ground out there and we'd lay on the blanket and look up at the stars and dad would dream and tell stories about work and the old days when he was a child and um, I, I just think that the lesson was that parents parents love their children I, I you know, it, it's um, if you don't learn that basic in life that you love the people who you're with, if you put on a facade of love, it's not the same as actual love where you do the stuff. So love does. That's a, a statement I know of more late training and learning. But so my parents believed that love does, and they did. They cooked for us. They cleaned for us. They 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 talked to us. They they listened to our stories. They they listened to our woes. They, simply, they I, I don't know, they disciplined us when we needed it, and, and I had lots of discipline, <laughs> because I needed it. <laughs> I, I was a live wire then, haven't changed much. Um, thankfully, nobody's thanking me now. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, I think it was that love does whatever is needed for the object, which is, the, I think, is the main lesson every human needs to learn. And they just did it by doing it. That was the lesson. Example. So for a final question, maybe we'll kind of go back to your, your childhood a little bit where you said you have, of course, uh, eight brothers and sisters, you being one of the eight. Uh, but outside of your brothers and sisters, uh, how about friends? What did you do with your friends when you were young? And did you have a best friend? Or was it just your brothers and sisters? So I will say that my earliest memory of things is that... My uncle Arnold and Aunt Irma lived across the street on Sharon Way when we were long. You're very young. And so I had access to cousins from across the street. And we we interchanged ideas and play times and all kinds of stuff for those early years. So um, my first main friend, if I was, were looking for one, was, was a family member. His name was Paul Stone. And then his uh, younger sibling, Mac, we spent a lot of hours together. Um, but since we were always 
church bound on Sundays and Wednesday nights. All of my all of my in laws on grandma's side, dad's side, mom's side, we knew. Dad's side, we didn't really know any of them ever. But for um, for mom's side, the family met at church twice a week, well three times a week because it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But my main early play playmates were. Paul was my age, so he was the natural, and uh, we grew up grew up together on Sharon Way, but um, it expanded into other cousins, which included older and younger. But Gary um, Gary Johnson was also both Daryl and I's playmate. We, we played with them a lot. But for school, when when I went to school, I had no trouble making friends. So I had friends at school that were just just close pals and buddies, and we. Uh, during that school year, we'd be buddies, and the next year I'd have a new one. So there wasn't somebody who lasted throughout the school years. When I when I went to um, from grade school to junior high in seventh grade, we moved into our house at uh, on the farm, and so I don't really remember any close friends in junior high. I'm sure there were some, but I. I mean, I guess I was just friends with so many that they don't any stand out as um, outstanding. So in junior high, things changed, but then back to high school, I had my cousins back in the school. So in freshman year, we all just got together for lunch, and I certainly had friends, but nobody that stands out more than more than family. So a lot, a lot of family. But when family moved away, I had no trouble making new friends. So Luke fits right into that. Um, that category is senior year. He became my best friend, and then his friends became my friends, including John Pierce and Ralph Hungerford, and so all the interconnections of, that friends do. Um, of course, Luke's now family, and uh, Ralph and John I haven't contacted either of them for years, but I would be comfortable contacting either one of them if they're still alive and healthy. Good friends. All right, well, thank you very much.